That's Chapel Town Law at 7.30 over on BBC Two. On District of Leeds, this programme contains scenes which some viewers may find disturbing. When Sadie Burton was charged with attempted murder, there was only one legal firm in the whole of Leeds she wanted to defend her. A legal aid practice in the heart of Chapel Town, whose reputation is to win the impossible cases. got a reputation of being a rough place, a dangerous place. It's had a lot of bad, really bad press, you know, really horrible press. It's very multiracial, very, very mixed. It's a very good, thriving community. I've heard certain taxi drivers refusing to go there at night and drop people off at night. It's quite a poor area, a lot of crime in the area. Historically, relations with the police have been difficult at times. The thing is, in this area, a lot of the police are stereotype about everyone. Whether they're known or they're not known, they still put them on the same level. That's why they make a lot of mistakes. And the mistakes that they made are embarrassing and a lot are hidden. You might see some like the odd few come alight and everybody speaks about it, but there's many more that don't come alight. Good morning, it's Mr. Ahmed, how can I help? Hello, Maren. We are a multiracial practice and that is terribly, terribly important to us. If we're attempting to represent people in the community and don't reflect that community within our own staff, then that's a disgrace. I think we should do even better than we have done. I haven't seen for ages. I know, I know, I know. We are just about 100% legal aid and a section of the practice deals with family, children, violence issues. Um, the section that I'm involved in deals with crime um, and immigration and I do quite a lot of inquest work. So this is, this is the sort of work we do. We don't do conveyancing of property, we don't do personal injury work. But the real joy really is, is, is working this, with this our clients. Better. This is me, look. Oh yeah, no, I keep looking at that one. Where? There. With that mask on? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it out. Hi. Sorry I didn't get back to you yesterday, but what can I do for you? Um, does, he need it, does he need to see us today? Oh, I, I think we're going to flip a lid, you know. I mean, to be honest, he's made promises to you that he can't deliver. He came in here, obviously not knowing what the law was in relation to what he was talking about to you. He was asking us advice, really, you know? OK. Um, yeah, make it half past if you want to. I mean, I, 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 Although I think that we are all absolutely exhausted by the amount of work that's got to be done, we are doing it with and for um, people who we like, people who on many occasions we think there but for the grace of God go I, and, 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 and it's, it's all worthwhile, ultimately. Got through, and James is in, and Lutel James has scored for Berry. His first ever league goal. The bounce favoured him, but he was persistent, and he is absolutely joyful. 
Th this is what the police say. We drew up alongside. Um, and as we did so, James alighted from his vehicle and began shouting, What you police Babylon going to do now? I'm among my brothers. I told him to calm down and got out of our vehicle. He then came up to me, placed his face about two inches from mine, poked me in the chest and said, come on then, I'll knock you out. I then pushed him away. He then said, I'm going to huff and kill you and took a step towards me. I told him he was under arrest for threatening behaviour. I then took hold of his arm, at which point he began to struggle and lash out. I could see about 20 youths start to gather round, shouting abuse and threats. I drew my CS incapacitant, warned James to stop struggling. He did not. I then sprayed him and warned the crowd to back away. We were joined by a Chapel Town unit who assisted us in trying to place James in handcuffs. He continued to struggle throughout, making the exercise difficult. He was eventually forced into the rear of our vehicle. We then started to have bricks and bottles thrown at us, causing damage to the police vehicle. The crowd were increasingly hostile and at one point attempted to rescue James from the driver's side of the vehicle. So that's their version. Let's just have another look. I know this is only part, but let's have another look. Police stations and, and prisons are very closed, secretive communities. And it's perhaps not surprising that one hears complaints of abuse of power. The people who work in them have extraordinary powers given to them. Uh, and they abuse those powers at times. And one hears quite extraordinary um, examples. Just had a double hernia repair. Right. So that means you, there's any movement at all and you just, you can feel it maximum pain. Mm -hmm. And it's uncomfy as hell. There's no way I'm going to be carrying on with nobody. Right. He's not listened to nothing I've got to say. Mm. He's just took out the CS and started spraying me in my face. Mm. Mm. And not only that, there's parts in there that say like, my brothers and Babylon, no. none of them words are used. They're going back in years that them things, words would have been used. Mm. And that shows what the lies that is building up mm. to try and make it all sound like a bigger story. Mm. Some police officers see us working against them and that, that's what the, the, they, they see us as trying to uh, undermine their good work, if you like. Um, but I, I think that others, I hope that others, see us as simply um, uh, being being a part of of, of, of the process of, 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 of justice. That's how I see it. They have their job to do and we have ours. I've seen some who have stood in the witness box and I've seen them lie quite obviously and I'm sure they don't feel very happy about what we do but uh, I, I don't uh, I don't feel bad about that. Well it's absolutely disgusting that, that Lutel should have to endure this. It's a, it's a, it's a public spectacle of, of humiliation. He is a well-known, respected person be, because of what he does. Lutel's a professional footballer. Um, if this can happen to him in circumstances which can't be justified, what level of antagonism is that going to build up and the ordinary guys who just happen to be on the pavement, they're going to think, if, if he's treated like that, what am I going to be treated like? More recent history of Chapel Town it starts with the 1981 riots, which were traumatic for the area. You still meet people in London who will say, ah, oh, Chapel Town, yes, of course. And that's what they're harking back to, because that's the only impression they have. I'm quite astonished that that impression has lasted as long as it has. Chapel Town, to me, is a good place to work, because um, there are very good supermarkets just down the road. There's a, a nice sandwich shop just down the road. Um, I walk around the area, and I have no fears at all for my, my safety. If you come into the area on a Sunday, you have difficulty getting down Hare Hills Avenue because of the, ch the church which is there and the people queuing up to get into it. So it's a, a very wrong impression that Chapel Town is simply an area where people commit crime and, and have riots.
I'm gonna have a fish. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Can we have two, two, two plates of fish, fish and rice. One of the great advantages of working in Chapel Town is the cuisine you get. Thank you very much. For three pounds, you can get a plate full of food, and it is the nicest food that you can eat. I left school and did a lot of dead end jobs. I came to live in England at sort of as a teenager. Where are you from? I'm from Trinidad originally. I came to England at such an impressionable age that I was I was very affected by what what I saw when I came to England and and sort of. I was very politicised by what I, I sort of experienced in England as well. And I did develop, start to develop an interest in sort of justice generally and, and particularly in sort of civil rights, what was going on on the street, you know, and that, that, a lot of that was motivation for me to sort of become a lawyer. You know, there's racism in Trinidad, there is institutional racism in Trinidad, but I never saw sort of overtly violent racism until I came to live in this country. Public perception is the asylum seekers are bogus. Uh, many of them are here uh, simply because they want a better life. The number of people coming to Yorkshire, it's, it, it, we are talking about several thousand a year. Many people would not believe that uh, they are tortured or persecuted in their countries and that that still happens. Okay, Lilia, we are here today as, um, and as you know, your, your interview with the Home Office is in, on 8th of October. Lilia is someone who got uh, involved in politics in, in Belarus, and today we will be. She is fighting for more democratic society, and um, she became also connected to the opposition and member of um, uh, social or political groups, uh, which then um, caused them to uh, made a few attempts on her life, um, trying to poison her. So she then fled the country. Uh, because obviously she couldn't stay there any, any longer. It was becoming very dangerous. She fled with the family over here and, and applied for asylum. I realized that my children and uh, my country were facing a great danger. Very soon after the referendum, I uh, noticed that unknown people watched me. Uh, they listened to my, to my telephone and read my mail. I know uh, these people were from Belarusian KGB. And they were following you at that time. Yes, I was uh, followed constantly. Koshenko uh, has a secret list of uh, his uh, uh, personal enemies. Uh, I was in this list, secret list. They try to blend in and look like ordinary people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, you can always tell you know, who they are. Uh, they dress differently, they all wear leather jackets. Uh, Law is the largest growth industry in Leeds, with a multi-million pound turnover the biggest legal centre outside London. But the gulf between commercial law and legal aid work is vast, and the solicitors at Harris and Bundy must make a vocational choice to forego the fat cat image and salary. All right, so there's no point in coming, it's not a case. We won't get any listings for a We'll see as we, we skip today and we'll run to any other business. Is there any other business? Hold you, you do have to be committed to work here, but, but a, a lot of our of applicants to work here say, well, it, it, you, you know, it, it's this firm I want to come to. Um, you know, they know what they're in for, they know it's very hard work, they, they know that the pay isn't marvellous, um, but they're part of a friendly atmosphere serving a local population um, who they will relate to. Are you going? Restricted, I didn't even know about it. Do you have, <coughs> to, wear, you have to wear beachwear trunks or can you just go in like... Oh, well, obviously, you come in class. Can I wear your pinny? That's all the better. What are you wearing? <laughs> My pinny. <laughs> shall, oh, well, shall, yeah. shall we get your photo around to show Mark? Yeah, no. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, With his marigolds on. <laughs> <laughs> Hands that like, do dishes can be soft as your face.
Right, Sadie, so this interview is being tape recorded and it may be given in evidence if your case is brought to trial. And I'm investigating an offence of attempt murder. He's recorded a reply upon you being arrested as being, I tried to kill him, I'm sorry, look what he's done to me. I was a bit um, hysterical. What they've recorded then is you saying, I only stabbed him because he threatened to kill my dogs. Yeah, I understood that I said that, but I was still a bit shocked. Yes. I certainly don't believe in, 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 in the kind of conveyor belt lawyer, if you like, who, who simply says, this is, this is my job, this is my speciality, leave it to me. You need to help people understand the process that they've suddenly found themselves unexpectedly in the middle of so that they can feel a bit more in control um, and a bit more um, comfortable with it. Well, I actually placed an ad on the teletext. Mm. I might add that um, I've got a bit of a background. Um, I was actually born male. And um, they discovered when I was about 13 that I suffered from Kleinfelter syndrome, oh which means I have an extra gene, which involved me having surgery, which I had done when I was 19. And basically my ad read, uh, design a label, post-op male to female TS. Right, so that was, that was what the advert said? Yeah, right. so it's a genuine right. article. Right, so it was absolutely clear to him, um, just through that advert, that that was your particular background. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so he didn't threaten or anything like that? All right. There'll be a phone call or someone will just turn up in the office. You know, usual situation is woman has been beaten up probably for years actually by her partner and there'll be one incident and you don't really know why it was that incident but one incident that just tips the balance and makes them realise they've got to do something. Started um, shouting and bawling at me, threatening to expose me and everything and um, calling me a freak and this, that and the other. This, is, this, this leg's almost black mm. with, with bruising. Mm. Why do you think he made such an onslaught on your legs in particular? I mean, was it perhaps at times the only um, bit of you he could he could reach or...? No, he said that he was going to start at the bottom and work his way up to the top. Right. And then um, he looked at me and he just said to me, if you don't have AIDS now, you will have by the time I've finished. And he grabbed his crutch and then he started coming towards me. And he grabbed, I was in a dressing gown and he grabbed hold of me round the neck by the dressing gown, forced me back onto the sofa and he raped me. And that was unprotected sex. And I was absolutely terrified, mm. do you know what I mean? As you know, this is going to have to be gone into in considerable detail at trial. So Sadie has a very, very clear case of self-defence. What I think will be very difficult for Sadie is the, is the press publicity because she's a very private person. Um, she is known to a large number of neighbours and friends simply as, you know, the woman who lives at number so-and-so. Um, and there's no earthly reason why anybody should know every detail of her past. But if that's going to come out at trial, then, then that's, you know, as I say, it's, it's, it's personal stuff and it's going to be hard for her to deal with that level of exposure. Hello? Hello, how can I help? It's Simon Namsu here from Harrison Bondies. Of assault and drugs and drugs. Um, is it possible to have a quick word with Michael on the phone? I'm in Chapel Town Police Station, Possibly you know, nearly time. every day. Michael, hi Michael, it's Simon from Bondi's. Michael, are you alright? Are you physically okay? 
Was there a bit of trouble during the arrest then? It's not a job that you could you could sort of fall out with people and get to, you know, get, you've got to be careful in this job. You've got to maintain that, you know, sort of professionalism within it. Because from the time you sort of, you know, you lose it with police officers or police officers lose it with you, you know, the defendant and the victim suffers. This is not a private conversation. You're on, you're on a police telephone and I don't want things recorded and used in evidence out of context, okay? So let's stay as touch about what happened until you get some advice on, on the evidence from me. Mr. Michael Rowe, please. Thank you very much, Tal. I've lodged a couple of complaints against police officers and police officers have probably complained against me. There's, I've only had, in 10 years, I've only had one incident where I've actually fallen out with a police officer to the extent that they were kicking us out of the police station. <laughs> Could we talk now, since then, the officers and I? Oh, it's 14 months of anguish. I mean, I got to a stage where I couldn't even eat anything solid. They was giving me liquid food because um, I just found it impossible to eat. It was just like a film set and I was watching what was going off. There was nothing else I could do. The first day of the trial, I was in the papers and it said uh, something like transsexual stabs abusive lover or something like that. And I got a group of kids come round and saying, you're a man, you're a man. And then I went to the local shop. Everyone just stopped talking and, I, you know, I could see them looking at me, you know, and it was as though I'd grown another head, you know. And I just said, oh, obviously, you've seen the newspapers. You know, I said, judge it for yourself. I said, um, just see what the outcome is. I think the trial has gone extremely well, and there have been some very surprising bits of evidence, I think, to the judge and the jury. The 999 tape, which I think has been absolutely key, also, um, one of Sadie's answerphone tapes, which had his voice on it. And when he was giving his evidence and presenting himself as, um, you know, the amenable, courteous, loving um, befriender, and then he had to listen to his own voice insulting her, calling her a f***ing hermaphrodite and everything else. I mean, I think the jury were able to size up something about his credibility at that point. We're now trying to pull everything together. Then the judge sums up and then the jury will be sent out to decide. Anyone that hears that tape, they'll know how terrified I was. That did churn my stomach over. It did really churn it over. Before he then collapses over one side of the sofa, apparently, um, she thinks that he's coming at her again. Um, and I think that that is really the last thing the jury should hear, just to remind themselves of that night and of her sheer panic um, and the context in which she did what she had to do. On the beginning of uh, November 1999, uh, my youngest son, Ivan, was coming home uh, from school. And it was uh, in winter, and it was uh, um, late, it was dark. He saw uh, a car coming uh, at uh, high speed towards him. I jumped out, but I uh, remember a number, and from the window, Cart is stop it, and from the window is uh, man uh, told that he that uh, we will mother. kill you and your mother. 
I realized that that squad uh, could kill myself, my sons and my husband at any time. I think she has quite a strong case. Um, we have also some independent agencies um, um, involved in this case um, who have uh, confirmed that her story is genuine and that what happened to her really it is, uh, has happened. Um, the, it's up to the Home Office now what they're going to do with the case. Um, we would expect them to grant her asylum um, because her life is obviously in danger. The Home Office may refuse her, in which case uh, it is very likely that we will appeal and then go to the court. It has to be shown that you intended to cause another person to believe that unlawful violence would be used against him or another. The prosecution must prove the offence beyond reasonable doubt. Having listened to all the evidence and watching the video, we do not accept that there is any evidence of you behaving in an aggressive manner towards the police officers, either physically or verbally, and we therefore find you not guilty. I've got kids, I've got two kids, and I don't want them to ever feel like I did. The part that I'm upset about is that they tried to send me to jail telling lies, and then they followed through with it. I believe that if they knew they were telling lies, I thought there was some time or another where they thought, you know what, just leave it alone because we was out of order. But they never once acknowledged that. They went in the courtroom, spoke to magistrates, and tried to convince the magistrates on their lies to send me to jail. And that is totally out of order. The police declined to be interviewed about Lutel James's case, but issued a statement to say that his file has now been passed to the Independent Police Complaints Authority for consideration. They acquitted her of attempted murder, they acquitted her of wounding with intent, and they acquitted her of wounding without intent. So she was found not guilty of every charge. She feels she's been laid bare. Her private life, um, her background, has now been revealed to all sorts of people that she had never spoken to in, in a personal way. She had cuttings pushed through her door um, of her own court case from neighbours and so on. She does hope to move away, but it's not as easy as that. But I think that this whole experience has put her so much in the public eye that she would like to retreat from that. enough for me to walk down the street without putting up with abuse. I think they're so clever. They can laugh and jeer at me, but they want to remember what, that, what I went through. Would they want their mothers or their sisters to go through what I went through that night? Because when it comes down to it, I'm a woman. And all I was was a lonely woman that wanted some love.